The account of Balaam, which we'll spend most of the sermon time just re, relearning or learning for the first time for some of you, is head scratching. It's crazy. It's fun. It's funny. And ultimately, it's incredibly encouraging for us, the people of God. So to put it into context, this is after the Israelites have come out of Egypt. They've crossed through the Red Sea. They'd come up to the Promised Land. The 12 spies had gone in. Ten of them had given their bad report. The Israelites go off wandering for 40 years. We're basically to the end of that 40 years of wandering. The Israelites have come. They've traveled to the east, gone around the country of Edom and Moab, and now they have conquered Zion and Og, two kind of minorish kings, to the north of Moab, and now they've traveled straight to the west to the banks of the Jordan River. They're on the north edge of the country of Moab. Balak, Balak is the king, not to be, not to keep mixed up with Balaam who we'll call the magician, just to keep him straight from Balak the king. Balak the king, probably pretty reasonably, looks at this horde of people and goes, man, I'm, I'm in a bad place. I've got to figure something out here. I've got to do something or this, this huge nation is going to lick up my whole country. They're going to take me over. Just like they had conquered Sion and Og and their kingdoms. Now let's do a big step back. We need to relearn something about the religious culture of those days. The religious culture of those days was that most people, not the Israelites, but most people thought that there was a whole bunch of gods, a whole bunch of deities out there, and that they were local deities. So that mountain had its own God, and the sea had its own God, and that area of the plains had its own God, and this little hill had its own minor God, etc., etc. And so Balak looks at this and he goes, all right, I don't know who their gods are, but I've got to get my gods to curse these people. That's the other part about the religious culture of that day was that the people thought that they could control God, the gods, uh, I should say, by their own actions. So Balak's thinking is, I need to get a great sorcerer. I need to get a great magician. And apparently Balaam was particularly well-known Archaeologists have actually found a wall that's collapsed that has uh, it's called, at a place called Deir Allah where his name, Balaam son of Beor, is recorded. So he apparently was a well-known guy. Apparently he was the God guy, the God manipulator, manipulator the sorcerer. Did God allow the devil to do stuff through Balaam? Maybe so. We don't know. Balak sends for Balaam. Come, curse these people for me. Balaam gives what sounds like this wonderful, pious answer. I can only do what God tells me to do. That night, God appears to Balaam. So, who are these guys who are visiting you? As if God doesn't know, huh? Oh, these are from Balak, the king, and they've asked me to come and curse these people. Don't go. So Balaam gets up in the morning and says to the messengers, sorry, God told me I can't go. So the messengers go back to Balaam, or Balak. Sounds great at this point, doesn't it? Balak says, tell you what, I'll send more messengers, even more powerful, important people. I'll send more money to pay him off. And back to Balaam, they go. God says, so at that point, Balaam should have just said, no, God told me I can't go, I'm not going. But instead he goes, hmm, I wonder if God's changed his mind. <laughs> and God says, all right, I'm going to let you go, but you're only going to say what I tell you to say. All right. At least Balaam seems to indicate that. 
But that's apparently not what Balaam's really thinking. Because as God, or as uh, Balaam takes off to head towards the Israelites, he's riding his donkey. And the angel of the Lord appears with a drawn sword and is going to kill Balaam. But Balaam can't see it. The donkey can. And so the donkey very wisely avoids the angel of the Lord with the drawn sword. I'd have done that too, right? Well, one time he crushes, his, crushes Balaam's wall, uh, leg up against the wall. He takes him off into a field. He simply lies down underneath him and won't move. Balaam beats the donkey once, twice, three times. And then God lets the donkey speak. And the donkey speaks to Balaam and says, Hey, I've been your donkey how many years now? Have I been in the habit of doing this? Don't you think I might have a good idea or I might have a good reason why I'm acting this way? And at that point, God allowed Balaam's eyes to be opened up and he saw the angel of the Lord standing there with the drawn sword. The path you are on is a reckless one, the angel of the Lord says to him. You say what I tell you to say. And off he goes. What do you recognize already? You recognize already the amazing patience and grace of God, don't you? That here's this guy who obviously has this idea that deities are local, nailed in his mind. He's talking to the true God, but he's thinking that somehow he can still go and curse the Israelites and do his own thing. And what does God do? Keeps working with him. Keeps reaching out to him. Keeps calling him to repentance. Keeps calling him to himself over and over and over again. What grace. What mercy. And isn't it such with you and me? How often don't we fall into this idea that you and I can somehow manipulate God? If I do a better job of coming to church and Bible study this year, then God's going to make me healthy this year. What? If I give more generous offerings, then God's going to have to bless me financially. Seriously? That God is some sort of a puppet and you and I are holding the strings? That's shameful. And yet how easily we slip into that kind of thinking. Off Balaam goes. And he gets there. And Balak has done sacrifices. And he says, come, curse these people for me. And Balaam with this garbage local deity idea tries. But guess what comes out of his mouth? Blessing. So they decide, yes, blessing. <laughs> so they decide, oh, let's go to a different place. Maybe you'll be able to curse them from there. It's that garbage local deity idea. Got it? Maybe if we move over here, maybe the God of that area, maybe that'll, that, that, that little local deity God will let you curse the people. Uh-uh. What comes out of his mouth? Blessing. One more time. Blessing again. The one we read a couple minutes ago is the final one. Balak's mad. Man, I brought you here to curse these people and all you've done is bless them. This is the fourth one. The last one. And what does he say? I see him. But not now. I behold him. But not near. A star will come out of Jacob. 
a scepter will rise out of Israel. Now let's fast forward. Almost 1,500 years later, about 1,400 years later, Magi from the east are going to come, or Magi are going to come. We're not exactly sure where the Magi are from. We've, we know next to nothing about the Magi, by the way. We don't know how many there were. We don't know for sure where they came from. We don't know for sure how long their journey was. We know there was at least two, but there could have been 20. We know they were plural. They saw the star. Why did they connect a new star to the birth of the Savior? The only thing that we know of from the Bible is this passage. Was it this passage that tipped the wise men off to say, huh, I guess we need to go to Jerusalem and see if we can find this brand new king of the Jews who's been born. That's the only explanation we have biblically that makes any sense. So can you imagine? God took these words of Balaam, who was trying to do what? Trying to curse the Israelites. And what did God do? He turned it into this amazing prophecy. This amazing prophecy that would lead Gentiles to come and worship the Savior. Do you get the impression that God really does want all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth? Oh, yeah! So what happens to Balaam? Boy, wouldn't you hope, think, pray that after all that God had done with Balaam, after all that Balaam had seen and heard, that Balaam would have gone back to his hometown, said, now I know that the only God is the true God and there's only one God and there's none of these local deities and I'm going to worship only the true God from now on. Wouldn't that have been great? Yeah, that would have been great. But that's not what happened. What happened is that the Moabites changed strategy. And they said, all right, if we can't get the gods to curse these people, let's instead try to bring these people into the worship of our own gods and let our own gods take care of them. We're still stuck in that local deity garbage. But the Moabite god worship was full of sexual immorality. And unfortunately, the Israelites bought in, or at least a lot of them did. Not all of them, but a whole lot of them did. God had to unleash a plague against his people. 24,000 people died. And this just before they're going to go into the promised land. They missed out by inches. All right, yards. And God tells his people to attack the Moabites. And they do. And in the battle that ensues, one of the people who is listed as a casualty is Balaam, son of Beor. And then the New Testament gives us a little bit more insight and talks about Balaam as one who strove after the wages of unrighteousness. In other words, the New Testament deals with him as an unbeliever. Can you imagine? This guy who had seen so much, this guy who God had worked with so patiently, so lovingly, so carefully, so clearly got all caught up in the dollars and cents and ended up going to hell because all he could see was the money. And so Balaam becomes this huge warning for you and me, brothers. 
how easy it is to get caught up in the things of this world. Amen? And maybe financial things are particularly distracting for, for us. Learn from Balaam. Learn. Learn how easy it is to lose your eternity for the sake of something that in the end will be oh so meaningless. You think Balak, Balaam cares now what he got paid by Balak after suffering 3,500 years in hell? Yeah, I don't think the money means a thing to him. But at the same time, my brothers and sisters, the account of Balaam is this wonderful encouragement for you and for me. What can God do? Anything. If he wants a donkey to talk, the donkey will talk. If people are trying to curse the people of God, which they will still do, your God is the ability to turn it into blessing. Your God is the ability to see all of time and to know how what happens today may impact people who live hundreds, even thousands of years from now. And how what happens today will be a blessing for those people who live hundreds, even thousands of years from now. And perhaps most helpful for us on this Epiphany Day, it's this wonderful reminder that God really does love the whole world. If God is willing to work patiently and graciously with a guy like Balaam, is he going to be willing to work patiently and graciously with people like you and me? Absolutely. And so, no, my brothers and sisters, K-N-O-W, no, know that God loves the whole world. Know that God wants the whole world to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And because of that, know beyond any shadow of a doubt that your God wants you in heaven eternally. Amen? And amen.